Um, good day. I'm speaking to Johan Bauer from the Herding Academy. Um, Johan, welcome and thank you very much for the opportunity and thank you for yeah, sharing your time with us. It's a pleasure, Jerry. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for coming all the way to the Karua yeah, to speak to well, us. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, Johan, it's really, um, you're one of the few institutions that really do, does um, regenerative agriculture and that actually does a training with it and that. Can you just explain exactly what you do at the Herding Academy? Yeah, so it was interesting. Maybe I should just give you a start with a bit of background on the mm. Herding Academy. So, like you've seen, this is a wildlife uh, reserve. So it's a quite quite extensive piece of land, and 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 my background is from a viticultural point, um, and I came in and I saw the degradation that happened obviously over hundreds of years in the Karoo and in the land. So the first question was how do we how do we mimic natural processes? Because we all knew and we all understand what, what, what happened in history with wildlife moving uh, from one area to another area and migrating over the country, uh, which was obviously then ended by fences and, and by, by, by sort of the colonial influence on agriculture. Uh, and we knew that in some way we've got to mimic that um, to prevent any overgrazing. And overgrazing, I'm talking about animals spending too much time on the same land, which is now currently happening all over the world, in all our national parks, in, our, in all our private game reserves. So how do, you, how do you change that? How do you sort of implement time control with wildlife that is actually stuck in an area? And, and, and the only tool there that I realized we had, and then I met Alan Savory, I went on one of Alan's courses, and I, it immediately came to me that we need to mimic the herd effect. Now you can do it in certain ways, you can do it either by introducing predators to an area, but if you're working with tourism and you, and you still want to enjoy the farm life, um, you know, you've got to look at alternatives. And that's where we decided to use herders and bring livestock onto the property and use herders with a sheepdog to control and to mimic the herd effect, obviously together with proper plant grazing. And, um, and we were quite skeptical because that happened in 2015 and it was and it was very dry. Since then, it was the worst drought in the history of the Karua. So I was quite skeptical on the results. Thought it will take at least five years, six years to see any results. Within three months, we could see change coming in. In soil health, um, regenerating sort of regrowth in plants and, and species, the animal. So, so obviously there was a lot of mistakes made um, and it took us two, three years to collect enough information and, and I sat with the rest of the guys, I sat with Roland Kruen and James Brody, and I said to them, guys, we need to share this information. This is like your 100% revolutionary work. We could see the change and we need to spread, we need to share that information. And that was where I decided to, 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 to establish the Herding Academy. And, um, and, and, it is, and it is quite interesting because the Herding Academy in itself also had quite a journey of change and Ad adaptation almost because it's the, that's the one thing in nature that we knew is going to happen it's constantly changing you need to constantly adapt to to that and even our learning programs you know if you uh, you can't you can't get stuck in science you can't get stuck in 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 in, in um, sort of curriculums that's 40 50 years old agricultural curriculums because nature is just changing constantly and it's so mm. complex the only way we can really manage complexity is by by changing and adapting, and that is the beauty of of, of the courses that we that we give, is is um, that is changing, and we can adapt the course even to your own context. So what we're not trying not to do is to tell people how to farm, and what we're not trying to do is also to say to people this is a recipe, this works. It, yeah. it doesn't necessarily work that way. Yeah, I think, we, um, I mean, we said it just now off camera or whatever, where we said the why is so important. So what we realized uh, very soon um, in training herders, because we specialize in training herders. So we, we got herders from the Conservation International, the Peace Parks Foundation. So we had, we had quite a big uh, power uh, um, uh, donors and, and, and partners at that stage. And the students came from all over Southern Africa. And we soon realized there's a few there's a few problems. You can train a herder and they can go back to their communities and, and they need to transfer that information to the chiefs because there's, a, there's a, quite a social hierarchy mm. in, the, in the rural Africa. That's the first stumble block, uh, is to get the message over and to convince elders and to convince chiefs to, to implement it. The second was that a lot of these countries 
uh, there's, there's, there's NGO programs running in them and, and the managers and the decision makers within the NGOs are, are either scientists or, or they, they, they're conventional conservationists in training. So they've never heard of what we what we're doing. So so to change that decision making is quite a challenge. So yes, you can put herders in the on the land, but the people that make the decisions actually um, they need to know what you're busy with, and that's why we developed over time the executive management course where we, we first go and train decision makers. Uh, so and then you train the herders, and uh, so people know what's what need to happen on the ground. So those are the few changes, a few changes that we've sort of grown into. The course started off as a year course, which was very difficult because, uh, you know, these guys are breadwinners, yes. uh, men and women. You're taking them from the communities and you, and you keep them here for a whole year. And, um, and they still need to earn salaries. They still need to provide an income for their families in Botswana or Zimbabwe, wherever they come from. So we soon realized it's, it, it's not sustainable to do it that way. So, so we've changed that course to a three-month course and we added the mentorship program. So what happens with the mentorship program is one of our trainer, trainers go back home with them and they, they actually assist in carrying the message over to, 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 to sort of um, to get the buy-in from the communities, the local communities, but also to help them implement. Um, and that, and that works, works quite nicely. Uh, but, but what is... I think the most exciting part of, of what happened in the meantime is with, on the executive courses is that we've really started to influence um, policy makers. So, so, oh, that's cool. so people that's, yeah. re that's really now joining our courses are, are the textile industry, um, the Agricultural Research Council, um, the, the Biodiversity Institute. You know, these are people that's really interested in what we're doing and what we've achieved. And that's the exciting part of it. Yeah, no, that's wonderful. Yeah. You've done over the years. You've also done a, your own research in that yeah. here on yeah. on water is on um, what rehydrating water and stuff like that. I know you had a Facebook page. I think it was last year or the year before, where you made these little dams and oh yes. Um, uh, and yes. Do you can you also on the herding? I know you've done it also on on your herding effects and that as well on your camps and that. Yeah. If you could actually um, elaborate a bit on yeah. that. Um, it's very. Exp Experimental, <laughs> yes. all of it. Um, I think going back to the why, why we do it is is because we're in a wildlife context. There's very few regenerative farmers that can apply the principles of regenerative agriculture in a wildlife context, um, because you have animals constantly on the same land, and and um, and the reason why. We started with this is, is, is the purpose, and my personal purpose in life is really to improve biodiversity all over the landscape. And if other people can see how we do it and why we're doing it, then you know, that's, that's a tick in the box for me in my lifetime. Um, and then there's areas on the property that need to be speed up. You know, the, yes, we can use animals, but sometimes, um, like you know in all plant grazing, sometimes you have... Um, you have enough animals for the for, for the food that you're growing. Other times in the year, like now, we don't have enough food for the animals. Mm. So, so it's either give or take, and so it's very cyclical. And 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 the reason for that is so 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 at some point you just don't have enough animals to make a difference, and that's where we use and employ a lot of people. So job creation and and and, and training is for us quite quite an important um, performance index. Um, so we use a lot of tools, other tools, mechanic as well as hand, to employ people uh, to make a difference on the land. And, and, what the, and it's really, really experimental, but the results that we've been seeing is absolutely amazing. Uh, comparing these actions and these rehabilitation actions to using animals, um, you can't actually compare it because using animals gives a t totally different perspective to, to, to changing biodiversity. So, Yes, you can spend a lot of money on erosion works, and you can spend a lot of money on, 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 on human capital making ponds, and it does work, but you still need animals to come over that land and to really, uh, because you, what you're doing is you're unlocking that carbon block by yes. using people, but now you've got to follow up with animals. And sometimes you just don't have enough animals to do the job, and mm. we have results of that as well. So the results that we're seeing is, 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 is where the animals work, the results are much higher. Uh, the nice thing about it is I think um, the animals create a lot more uh, carbon in the soil through their hoof action, through mulching, through, through their manure, through just gut and microbes that's yes. really cycling in that system. Whereas uh, on the other actions, yes, there's actions, but there's 
you don't really get that natural cycle going. You still need animal component on top of that. So, so yes, we find the results more or less over the property, and it's not real scientific results at this stage. We, we're in the process of, of getting scientific proof on all the actions. Yeah. Um, but we, what we really see is, is that even in our, in our brittle environment that we see a lot better results using animals um, mm. than, than the others. And obviously the animals are the only really tool that creates a cash flow, a positive cash flow on a, res on a, on a game reserve. Yes. Yeah. And, um, but initially I think the whole program started off by, by saying how do we bridge human wildlife conflict by by using both agriculture as well as a wildlife setup and really use that as, as a model to tell people, you know, in Africa that you can do both together. Yes. And, yeah. it's, and it's both beneficial to each other. Mm. I think that's important thing is where you always, where you've now repeatedly said that the animals, the animal impact yeah. does it so much faster yeah. is really a, we're talking of policy makers and yeah. that where the people want to get the ruminants off the land. That's right. And I mean, that's stupid. It's, it's, it is, I don't know, um, where they get the idea from, but it's they must somehow that must change. And there's there's too yeah. many examples already um, with ultra density grazing, with high density grazing, and yeah. just getting animals yeah. on and the sufficient yeah. rest that the biomass or the and the diversity actually does change. Yeah. And that is I think it's essential that that work carries on and that those results make get made public at least. Yeah, it's it's a you know you you we've got to do here with the with, uh, with a paradigm, um, with a paradigm of, of, of people competing with, with, with animal numbers. Um, and so, so the one blames the other. Yes. Uh, and it's a worldwide paradigm. But what people really need to understand is that, that we cannot live apart. We cannot live, the one cannot live without the other. Yeah. Uh, people and nature. Well, animals will live nature without needs, us. Exactly. <laughs> nature needs animals to survive. Yeah. Not humans. Especially in the more brittle areas, you know, mm -hmm. um, more brittle areas are, are animals, animal dependent. And we've seen it, we've seen it even on this property where you take animals off a certain piece of land and that land just degenerates. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so, so putting animals back onto that in a proper plan grazing way and really reading what nature is telling you by doing that. Um, is, is the important part because you've got to you've actually got to understand the language of nature yeah. to understand what the role of animals is and if if people over the over the globe can understand the role and the importance of using animals um, in this ecological process then I think it will change but you know to change paradigms Alan Savory used to say you know it takes up to 200 years for yeah. people to change paradigms uh, it's not going to be an easy job but mm. we you know, you start small, you tell people about what you're doing, show people the results, and then you slowly start changing mindsets, you know. So if, if a lot more people can do that, I think globally, um, this, we'll probably see some change yeah. within that. You do quite a bit of bale grazing. Yes. And that as well. yes. I mean, it's, and it, regard, let's leave the cost of it, because there's yeah. a, there a definite cost yes. involved, in it. but I mean, the effects of it. Yeah, so, so, so bale grazing was quite interesting, and it's something that happened in, in, in the drought. Uh, we put a, f a few bales out for animals, um, mostly to feed animals. Uh, you know, and, and uh, coming back to that is you're not supposed to feed animals. Because it's in a controlled environment, animals can't move to better grazing anymore. Mm. So now, you know, we, we sort of need to take care of that. And destock normally early enough not to, be, not, not to get into a position where you have to feed animals. Um, so it's not the ideal environment. So at that time, we, ha we, we obviously anticipated rain. We didn't get rain. I've put a few bales out. And, and six months later, we just saw those areas where we put the bales out just totally transforming above the ground as well as under the ground. And, um, and we sat with vast old historic erosion areas. And I got the guys together. I said, guys, let's, let's mimic what we've done here on a massive scale. We know we're in a drought. We know next year we're going to probably have to feed again. So let's use the same amount of feed. Instead of feeding it in a feed bin or putting it out in a specific spot, let's just use those bales in areas where we really want the animals to do their work for us. And that was the trial. So, so we did hectares and hectares of that. We, 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 some of the lands we've actually cleared, we've plowed it over, we've broken the crust. Because um, it's old, rural erosion, you know. Yes. Some of it was quite deep donga. So reshape 
reshape the landscape back to what it was, was, it was quite an exercise. Um, and the reason for that is you've got to rehydrate the landscape as well in a bigger yes. scale. Yeah, so yeah. yes, it's fine to, to have hoof impact on certain areas, especially trying to stop the drop at the higher lying areas, because you don't want that flow off, but you still got to repair the mm. damage that was done. Um, and that's very expensive to do. So we've done that with, with machines and then we started putting the bales out on those areas and the wildlife came in and they just started working the, yeah. the, that into the land as a cover. Because there's no other cover. If you, I think if you have alternative cover to use, then, then use that as a tool. But for us, we had the tool of feeding. Yes. Um, so apply it just differently. Um, and it's interesting because the critics normally say to you, yeah, but you know, guys, you can maybe afford to feed that amount of animals. And it's not true. Because, I mean, I'm, I run a very strict uh, financial plan and I knew I've got to feed animals. The only difference is we've just fed them differently than the neighbors yeah. and other people. So instead of feeding them a specific spot, we just use that tool to mm. I to just want to come back mm. to where you said you used mechanical um, yes. and mechanical, not, not only, and it's, it's actually very cool, in, just yeah. in regards to, because you have to work towards your context. Yes. And you, technology is not the enemy. No. So, um, I mean... Look, so, I've, yeah. I've, I've, seen, I've seen similar work be, uh, done by animals over 20 and 30 years. Yeah. Uh, the problem is, are you, are you willing to wait that long? Mm. And, 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 and I think in our context, I really want to do the most work in my lifetime and, the, and bring the biggest change to this property as soon as I can. Yeah. And as soon as this financial model can support it. You know, so, so for us, it's getting the work done quickly. I mean, we, we work on the slopes with the animals on the, on the sort of the first grade of erosion where you're just trying to get the better cover. So stopping the drop there does help a lot. Um, but as soon as, as water starts generating energy, it just flows. So you, you still want to stop it further down. Mm. Um, interesting, interesting results from that is if you speak to James Brody, which is my neighbor at the bottom here, um, since we've been doing our work at St. Olive's, his erosion and his, his uh, sort of dongas and things have been filling up. So they've been closing up, not filling up, closing yeah, up. Close, yeah. Which okay. is interesting because there's a lot less down flow of yeah. water running, running through his property at the moment. So he's very thankful for what we're doing on this side. So you see the re results down the water chain, yeah? Yeah. Uh, which is very interesting. I actually want to take you back to and the context of it. So yeah. that you, because it's... Um, and I mean, on my farmer's days that we've had as well, the guys want a recipe. Ah, and, yes. uh, because <laughs> farm towards your context, if you can actually just elaborate a bit on that as well. Yeah, I think um, the important thing here is to understand there is no recipe. If you, if you work with something as complex as nature, then there's no recipe. You've got to adapt, you've got to understand the principles. Um, you've got to read nature and the response that nature gives you. So, so all I can normally tell people, I, the last thing I want to do is for, to tell people how to farm in their because every person's got a different mm. context. I use animals in three different models on this property for three different contexts. So, so the one is a wildlife reserve, open wildlife reserve. Here on this property, we run a herd of buffalo. Um, uh, and I'm sure that's probably the only one in the world that we're using a, a herd of wild buffalo to do the regenerative work for us. And then on the other side of the property, I'm, I run a proper sheep operation, which is, which is a different context because there it's about production. Mm. And, and biodiversity comes second and, and, and then landscape function thirdly. Whereas in the open reserve, we run biodiversity first, landscape and then animal production maybe later. Mm. So, so it, it, it's a different context. Every person's got a different context. Some people want to farm textile. Uh, with bull, some people go in for meat, some people go for wildlife, it's, uh, some people in tourism. So tourism is a, is a massive driver of this and, and that's, I think that's one of the problems maybe today is, is how do you convey the message over to tourists. If you're in a wildlife reserve and tourists in a herd of animals coming through, how do you convey that message? Mm. How do you tell him in the evening that he sits and he eats a plate of food that, that what he eats actually com comes off the land and how that meat actually improved the land? Um, instead of being seen as vilified, vilified yeah. whatever, yeah. So, so yeah, there's, I think we've got a duty to do towards that, you yeah. know. I think there's two issues as well in regards to context and that as well. And it's, it is, it said it better in Afrikaans, Elke slang, Elke paradise, it's a slang. So, <laughs> yeah. it is, it's true, every paradise has its snake. So, I mean, it, yeah. it's regardless where you are. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You always get it, you know, and and um, and sometimes you're just dumped in a box of snakes, you know. So, and you get a, you've got to survive and get out of yeah. it. 
but it's interesting because the snake can become your friend as well and that snake can can have a purpose within your broader context yeah. you know we're just taking the example of locust you know so it's interesting because locust seen as a pest still today since biblical times yeah but it's interesting because in biblical times it was also used as a tool as a tool to move people from one <laughs> area to another area <laughs> And you're just thinking about that and say, okay, but, you know, isn't that supposed to happen? Aren't we supposed to use locust as a tool? If you really go down on your knees and you look at the insects and the role that insects play, especially locusts, and, and you see them cycling the green material and put that on the, on the ground uh, through termites and through ants and through, through that system, if you look at that and how that thing how efficient that thing operates. It's more efficient than any animal. Mm. It turns carbon quicker than any animal can do. So you've got, really got to ask yourself, the question is, is by killing those and by spraying chemicals and what damage are you actually doing? Um, you know, if you want to grow one plant per, hec per square meter extra on your farm, is it really wise to spray and to kill that whole spectrum of animals? Yeah. You know? um, just because you want to save a bit of grazing. Uh, we've lost, in the last year with our locusts, we've lost about 30% of our crop. And grass crop now, yeah. Plant crop, yeah. yeah. So, and, 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 and how we see it is, you go back to your grazing plan, this thing that's here, that's lying back in, my, in my bag, you go back to your grazing plan, you subtract 30% of your stock days per hectare. Yeah. And that's it, and you just replan, you replan and you carry on. The results that we've seen from locusts is that felt that's been been eaten by locusts, and locusts never killed any plant. So, so the felt that's been eaten by locusts responds definitely a lot faster than felt that hasn't been eaten by locusts. You know, so 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 there's things we can't explain that's happening, but uh, I think it's also um, arrogant to, to to say and to think that you know how nature functions. You know, it's so complex that we do not know a lot about how nature yeah. functions and the purpose of those things you know so so yes it's a challenge that's a snake in the box uh if you can if you can say that because you get a lot of critics around um you know from even i mean that it's law you've got to spray those those things yeah. and, and we're questioning that and we're doing research on that and we've got to challenge that that conventional thinking uh, and we've got the results to show for that, you know. I think, I mean, Rowley said it yesterday in the interview. I mean, it's, if, you, if you would spray and it would stop it, yeah. that would be okay. But if it comes back next year, is your intervention this year actually working yeah. or not? Is so it, if, yeah. it's, if your intervention works, then we wouldn't yeah. have to repeat it. That's right. So That's right. I think, and I think that is, um, it, it's like... Um, so, I mean, is it, so the question is, is the locust there because of your spraying? Yeah. Or is the locust there because of your wire farming? Mm. Is a locust there maybe because of all the bare soil? Because we know locust lays eggs in, in capped sandy soil. Yeah. So, so, so is the lake, locust a consequence of the way that we've been farming for the last few centuries? Um, and I do believe that. I believe that that's it. the locust and any plague is a consequence of an action that, that happened. So mm. is spraying just covering it up? Uh, yeah. Or do we really need to change our mindsets around how we managing it? And, 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 and those locusts may be an asset to us, you know. Yeah. So, so I think it's a different perspective on different problems. The snake could be your friend. Yeah. <laughs> no, and I, I think the, 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 I mean, it's the, the reaction to mm -hmm. no, hail is the same. That's so right. I mean, it's, it right. is... Um, yeah, devastating. Yeah. Um, and, and, and especially I've seen it in the fruit industry and the wine industry where the damage that health can bring. But I also understand the concept of pruning. Mm. Uh, and that's a very natural way. Uh, fire is a natural occurring phenomenon. Mm. Uh, but do not let fire become your master. Uh, then you're in, a pro in, a, in trouble. Yeah. So it, it's, it's the same with all the other tools you have in your toolbox. As soon as your tools become uh, addictive and, and, and becomes your master, you depend on them, then you're in trouble. And that's the interesting thing of, of, of learning from nature. Uh, nature tells you exactly what it wants to do when you apply a certain tool to it. Mm. You know, uh, it's just a question of, I think we're just sitting with a whole lot of lazy farmers. People do not get out into the felt anymore, go on their knees and actually see what's really happening in the soil, what's really happening in the biodiversity. Mm. Um, I think that's what makes regenerative agriculture so interesting as well. You have to freaking work. I mean, or yeah, not work, you have yeah. to manage. You have to 
like what you said just now, if this happens, yeah. I've, got you've got to, I've got to, I've, yeah, you've got yeah. to be hands on. You cannot let it own to its own devices. And I think you know what I think what happened. Um, agriculture became easy because of agrochemicals and because mm. of, of 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 maybe technology. I'm not. I don't know. But but farmers were, became disconnected from nature. I think mm. farmers came, became because they're not in the felt with the sheep, seeing what's happening. Um, and I mean, I'm, I'm, I was as guilty in a monoculture because of that. You get totally disconnected in a monoculture or, uh, with nature. So, so I totally understand that context and I understand where that comes from. And what, for me, what is, what is really um, uh, rewarding with this is that it is the reconnection. Mm. And I think we see that in these courses that we're doing is, is that you really reconnect the student to nature. And that's the powerful thing. You know, if you can bring someone here, and that's also why we choose to, to bring people here and not to do training on site, because yeah. you do not really take that person out of his comfort zone. You know, mm. take them out of the comfort zone, reconnect them to nature. They go back with totally different eyes and totally different perspective. And, and I think that is from my personal experience, what, ha what happened in my life is, is I all of a sudden realized how we depend on nature and how closely we've got to work with nature to really understand that language. And my herders, mm. normally, they, my herders, speak they when they when they when they speak about this they, they talk about the language of nature understanding the ability to understand the language of nature yeah. and that's really what we're trying to teach people i think it's interesting this this disconnect in that because it is yeah. a it, it and it's if you have a problem you must treat it you don't yeah. um it's sometimes the, the the whole system your immune system your predator prey yeah. relationship yeah. isn't right you've got to do something about it, um, right. in it. and there's a further, but, further disconnect i mean the further disconnect is is with the consumer the, the yes, disconnect even, between yeah. consumer and yes. farmer yeah. um i mean that's massive and i think that's probably one of the biggest drivers for the anti-meat and the anti yes yeah, yeah, yeah. And the everything. Mm. But know uh, your, it's a disconnection. Yeah. You know? And it's you have to know your farmer. Or yeah. know where your food comes from at least. Because I mean it's it is you're relying yeah. on but someone. But if you, if you if you understand how nature functions, you would understand that nature needs the role of hitting animals. Mm. Yeah. Well, already that solves a lot of problems. Yes. Yeah. Um, just just look at nature. Just look in the way where a lion or a predator approach a herd of animals and and what happens when that when that predator get closer to that herd. Mm. What happens to that herd? And that's exactly the herd effect that we're trying to mimic. And if you start understanding that is a role of nature, we can mimic that specific role we can mimic on a farm. Mm. And it's not difficult to do that. And the results from that is just absolutely astonishing. So if, if the broader public and consumer can start understanding those natural processes and how we can apply that into our farming operations, then it will solve a lot of Mm. Paradigms. Yes, I think. yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, Johan, thank you very much. I'm going to come take you back to your buffalo in it because mm. I think you must be one of the few herds in South Africa or in, in, in the game industry at least yeah. that does rotational grazing yeah. with wild animals. Yeah. Yes. Firstly, I think there's two, there's two issues I've got there. Firstly, it's the game industry. It's not, I, I don't see it as a game industry because <laughs> the game is something that you play somewhere else. Uh, this is definitely game is definitely not the game not the not uh, you know Depends wildlife you. wildlife is not the game okay <laughs> it's very complex and and i prefer the world word wildlife because there's a disconnect between game and wildlife mm. and and unfortunately the game industry is guilty of that is where game became the focus and the context um, and the ecological system just fell away and got massively hammered because of that. So, so I'm talking of wildlife, and wildlife is the whole ecological system. So, which is important because mm. if you, you you cannot breed an a, a animal if if the rest of the foundation, ecological foundation blocks, is not in order. Yes. Okay. You know, so, so that's the one thing. The other thing that you mentioned is rotational grazing. So, so rotational grazing in 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 the wildlife um, context which we apply is not happening. We don't do rotational grazing, we do proper plain grazing. And the difference there is that we do not move animals from one area to another area consecutively and we know that we're going to be here two days, three days, four days, five days. Uh, that's rotational grazing. And unfortunately a lot of, a lot of um, regenerative holistic plant grazing farmers fall into that category. So they start off with, with, with plant grazing and it becomes easy and it becomes a routine. As and soon as it becomes a routine, you fall into, um, into rotational grazing. 
and that's the default. Planned grazing is different because you need to monitor your land, you've got to give feedback, you, you're not coming back to each camp every year for the same amount of days but you, because it gets determined by water, it gets determined by growth rate of the plants, it gets determined by, by divers, diversity or your context. What do you want to farm with? Do you want to, do you want to see grasslands? Do you want to see a mix of bossy felt and grassland or do you only want to see karua felt? So your, that context determines the way that you plan your grazing. So it's planned grazing. So that is that is that is just so. But the, the the real the real challenge in the wildlife industry is is to apply planned grazing, because you're sitting with wildlife that's roaming all over the property, um, like in either, any other private game reserve or national park. And that's the biggest challenge today in conservation, is there's no time control. Um, and uh, that's still my biggest challenge is how do you apply time control within the wildlife context? Um, and, and the way, there's a few ways that we're trying to do it. So the one way is by using herders. Um, so it's a person with a dog with a herd of a thousand sheep that literally moves on a plant grazing, proper plant grazing method. And you'll see here, this is the, this is the um, uh, imaginary camp. So the whole property is divided up in imaginary camps. And that camp in itself gets divided up. Um, so you determine stock days per hectare per 100 millimeters of rain, and you determine how long you're going to be with that flock inside that area. And it will not be the same next year, okay? So, or the next time that you come around. That forces animals to move. And the interesting thing about that is, is that the result, the result of the herd effect, applying herd effect in the felt, it generates growth. It, gener it regenerates life as it moves. So what you'll find in a wildlife reserve, if you apply the herding principle, is that, is that a few months later, the wildlife just moves into a natural pattern behind that because it stimulates, yes. it stimulates growth. So it's a very interesting pattern that that's happening. That doesn't cause overgrazing in it, this brittle environment. I'm asking no, the, no, not, so, not so overgrazing, overgrazing is a function of time and a function of, of, of the stage of where your plant growth is. Yeah. So, so okay. that's the challenge, is to keep wildlife off a certain area for the plants to go into the second phase yeah. where they can okay. properly cycle carbon and cycle solar energy into the soil. And that's the challenge. So in some, in some instances, especially with some species, you've actually got to sell, you've got to destock. So we destock either by hunting, because there's a lot of op hunting operations happening in the wildlife industry, or by selling live animals to breeders. So that's what we're trying to do. So certain species you've got to destock because they're territorial and they stay in one area constantly stock them and then you bring in your herds and you, you move them over those areas and you just rest and and that seems to work because if you look we've, we're boarding in the south here to the Camp de Boer National Park and the only difference between us and the Camp de Boer National Park is we've got the same amount of, of, of carrying capacity so we keep the same amount of wildlife constantly on the same land and the only difference with us is we bring in a herd of, of, of livestock domestic stock to really work the land and you see a clear difference between the two types of felt. So it does work. It doesn't work as effective as this buffalo herd where you move in with a buffalo herd and you move out and you rest it for a specific time. Yes. Okay. There's still less rest, but there's still, it still makes a difference. Okay. So, so we slowly, slowly taking small steps and figuring out what we're going to do. But, but that's in our context. So I cannot say yes. to people, yeah, yeah. listen, this is what you've got to do. Yeah, I can only show them the results and I can only show them the cash flow of, of the return on livestock. Using livestock within the wildlife reserve does create another level of income and it does create another level of carbon building under yeah. the soil. Yeah. So those are the two extra streams that you've got to look at. Now, if you sell that story to your, to your tourist um, and explain it properly, I think, uh, I think you will win it. You know? uh, I think we'll get there. Just on a totally different context now, if you take the national parks, I mean, they really, I think the last yeah. thing that you want to see is, is someone who a, 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 a thing of nguni or sheep or whatever coming through. How, I mean, there's uh, lots of opportunity the, in that. Yeah, go for it. Yeah, so I think, I think especially where, where you've got communities, and that's the purpose of, of why we're training with Conservation International and, 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 Peace Box. and the Peace Box Foundation, is that we're training communities around those conservation areas. And the conservation is now, now sort of realizing the importance of firstly employing people, so creating jobs, but also using livestock to improve 
felt conditions in a, in a planned grazing way, not just moving in and out of an area, yeah. but in a, in a planned grazing way that you can improve even the, that conservation areas. So, and then obviously talking about food security, because herding for those communities in rural Africa is really natural, it's, an, it's a natural occurrence. You've got to utilize it as an asset to improve health conditions and to pr improve livelihoods, the social, mm. uh, social environment. So it's, it's a multi-layer function. You know, you, you, you speak of job creation, you speak of employ, uh, yeah, employment and then, and then social and economic and, and ecological wealth. Mm. I think one thing is you can't teach what conservation on an empty stomach. No, you can't. No, you can't. And yeah. unfortunately, um, if you look at the national parks all over the world, it's not only South Africa. It, it, this is happening all over the world where people say, in order to, to uh, repair, you've got to leave it. Mm. And unfortunately, it had the opposite, opposite uh, effect. So we have to look at that. The opportunities that we're seeing in this is, um, if you look at a national park, you've got smaller and informal and informal communities who has animals around that area and small farmers, uh, that small startup farmers. Get those guys together, gather them together, gather those flocks together, and go into a sort of a planned grazing agreement with your national park. Say, listen, can we be allowed this year to use that area and to work the land for you? Next year you open that up to tourists and we move to another area yes. and we yeah, start yeah. working that area for you. So, so there's, there's all sorts of opportunities in this. Mm -hmm. um, I'd actually like to talk uh, to, uh, that you talk about a bit on fire being yes. in that area as well because yeah. I mean it's, it is, it's also a tool. Yeah, it's a tool but it's a bad master. Yeah. You know? um, so, so again, if you, become, if you become dependent on fire then, then you, become, and you create fire dependent species as well. Uh, which only depends on fire. We've seen, we've seen using livestock instead of using fire on sour felt, which is a conventional way of, of, of utilizing fire felt is by burning it. Mm. And it re-sprouts. The problem with fire is you take all the carbon out of the soil and you put it in the air. Whereas you use the herd effect on sour felt, and we can go out and I can show you a few examples of that, a total species change immediately. Uh, the one thing that, that, that sour felt cannot handle is high animal impact. And, and you do it once off and it's gone and you, you've got a total species change, which is interesting. So fire is a very handy tool if you, if, if you don't depend on it. Um, we get fires by lightning and we try and manage that. We, we, we put it out, but normally it's high up in the mountains where we have a, normally an issue of, of sour felt combined with uh, our pace and these kind of things. So, so, so fire is not always a bad thing, mm. but it dep also, also depends on what you do after the fire. Then we've got to take the animals in there to really change the species composition. And what that, what that does is also reduce the risk of fire going into the future because dead seed pool, there's nothing as, as sort of uh, fire inflicting as dead seed pool. Yeah. Now, if you've got a species change to sweet felt and you utilize that with your animals because now, because there's sweet felt up there, your animals will, your wildlife and things will move up there and they will graze it. Immediately lower your risk of fire over time. Mm. So yes, fire, I think at, at times is a handy tool, but do not get dependent on it. Mm. Yeah, it's, it wasn't your fire not here. I was actually talking about the net fires in the national oh, parks. in the national parks, yes. Yeah, yeah. And also doing mosaic burning. In that's it, right, as well, that's because right. Because so, I mean, it's, yeah. yeah. Mosaic burning, I think, is a very handy tool to use. Mm. Again, as long as you don't get dependent on it, mm. and as long as you don't burn massive pieces, because you do need to take care of your biodiversity. So burning small pieces continuously throughout the park, firstly create fire breaks, secondly yes. it creates grazing. So firstly it improves biodiversity. So the smaller and the colder fire you can burn, um, uh, and that's the difference is, 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 is people's got to check on when they burn, what time of the year, because mm. the fires, hot fire is obviously totally different than a cold fire. Yeah. If you can create small patches of fire like they do in the Kruger National Park at the moment with mosaic burning, perfect. Perfect. It's the right time of the year. It's, mm. it's a cold fire. It, it increases biodiversity. It doesn't destroy biodiversity. So again, you've got to be to in total contact with, yes, with, with contact. nature to really yeah. see what is the effect of that. So yes, it's a very handy tool if you manage it properly. Yeah. The same yeah. with goats. So people, yes. people yeah. often, often blame goats um, as the cause of overgrazing in spectrum, for instance. Yeah. You know, normally when you read a report on, on, on spectrum in a certain area, the first paragraph will blame the goats. Uh, the goats has historically destroyed the spectrum. Um, how many times have we said it's not the goats, it's human management. 
Mm. And the way you manage animals, the way people manage fire, the way people manage your own tools, fences, water, um, name all the tools that you've got, human capital, uh, the way you manage it determines your outcomes. You know, so a goat is very good. I mean, goats being used all over the world for different sort of purposes. Um, but it really boils down to human management and human understanding of nature. Mm. And I think that is where we come back again to the disconnect that we have. Yeah. It's been, a, it's been quite an interesting journey. The one thing that I did learn is, is do not assume that what you're doing is right. Yeah, so, and that's powerful. So, so you question really every action. Yeah. Uh, and it's a consciousness that it's, 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 you know, people say, yeah, but it's negative, you know, it's negative thoughts and, and, uh, and things like that. But it does make you question every action and, and the purpose of why did, why did you move again to that camp for three days? You were there last year three days. Why is it three days again? Mm. And explain, explain that. Because yeah. didn't you change anything? So, or putting a bale out to feed animals. Is it really worth it and for what purpose am I doing it and and shall we really be doing it yeah. uh, same with every other action I, you need to question and people like you for that you're not you know you're, you're not popular okay that's that's not why we're here uh, we're not in a popularity contest so so I question everything but I think that the other value of you're not always right or is what you're doing yeah um, could it be wrong is yes. really um, you've got to think about it that's right and, and, and I mean think just alone. makes you stand back yes yeah. Two steps and you say, okay, yes, yeah. uh, was this real, the right thing mm. to do? And you just question again and you measure it against your context. Yeah. And you say, okay, maybe we shouldn't do it today. Yeah. Maybe I shouldn't drive to town today. Is it, am I really contributing to the context? Yeah. Or am I actually you know, degenerating instead of regenerating mm. in that decision? So what I'm trying to do in our setup here is, is to really create the ecological consciousness. Is If you go to small things, driving to town today. Are you contributing ecologically or are you actually decreasing? So you've got the scale of either regenerating or degenerating. Where in that decision-making framework is your choice that you're making? The fact that I'm spending my time today here with you is, it, am I contributing to that fact or am I actually taking energy out of this, this yeah. operation? And de de so, so those are the consciousness that I would like to say that I'm creating within my group. Is, is really to ask yourself that question. Is it worth it? Am I doing the right thing? Yeah. You know? You, before, off camera again, before we even started the yeah. interview, you spoke about feeding. And I'm actually just yes. going to get you back to that because yes. it actually boils down yes. to such a small step. If you can yeah. just repeat that actually. It's, uh, feeding is an interesting con con concept. And in my context, I'm often guilty of feeding because uh, you love your animals, you know, so you're emotionally attached to the animals, which, which is a problem because you rather keep the animals and feed them than, than destocking them and yeah. getting rid of them and rest your felt. So it's always a very emotional uh, thing to feed, to feed animals and to make the decision of to feed or not to feed. The interesting thing of that was if you really get on your knees and, and you see per square meter, if you can increase seven grams of edible roughage per square meter on a property of, take an average property of the Karoo of 5,000 hectares. If you can increase seven grams per square meter, you decrease your feeding bowl by two million rand per year. Yeah. And that's how simple it gets. So again, go back on your knees and say, how, to, how can you, how can you, how can you create one more plant per square meter on your property and you will be amazed at how much value you add and not have to feed. Mm. Um, so again, sometimes you have, in, and it's quite seasonal, especially in our brittle environment, sometimes you've got in, more food than animals and sometimes you've got more animals than feed. And those are the decisions that you really need to make is, is when are you destocking? Because um, the one thing that we know is there is an extra drought coming. Yeah. That's the one thing that we are sure of. And the interesting thing, if you think about that, that you are expecting the next drought within the next few years, what am I going to do today to prevent me from being in the same place of feeding animals in the next drought? Yeah. So, can, so I've got a few years to increase one plant per square meter on the property, then I actually don't have to feed the next drought. Mm. So that is how powerful it really is. 
So, so, you know, in our lifetimes as a farmer, you've got on average about 30 seasons to work with. Um, and, and you've got 30 seasons to make a difference in your life as well as your children's lives. So it's, it, it becomes really powerful if you look at the land and see in over 30 seasons of which maybe one third is drought, how do I change that? How do I, how do I incorporate that into my everyday decision making? Mm. And then you go down on your knees, you become humble, you say, what tools do I have in my toolbox now to make a difference in the next life? You know, and how do I create f uh, enough of this biodiversity? Because uh, the more diverse your landscape is, the more resist re resilient you, you are for droughts and fire and all the other pests that you can, mm. you can think of. So how do we create resilience through what we're doing every day? Yeah, and that's, that's that coming back to that ecological consciousness that, that, that I'm trying. And that's the purpose of, I think, the Heading Academy is we really want to create that attachment, reattachment, that reconnection with nature, but also the consciousness. Mm. You've taken it bad. Back to full circle now to the Herding Academy. Yeah. I'm actually going to ask you who are yeah. your clients and what do, who do you envision as your clients yeah. and, and so that you can actually... Yeah, so the Herding Academy was, was, was I founded the Herding Academy with the support of obviously Johan Gain or Rupert uh, massively contributed I mean, yeah. uh, to, 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 to the vision. Um, it, it really didn't take me long to convince them because they, they're, such, uh, they're such passionate environmentalist conservationists. Um, and they saw the difference immediately. So, 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 you know, all the credit need to go to Johan and Gaynor, who's really passionate about the career, really passionate about the people. Um, so, so it's absolute pleasure to to work with passionate people. And again, mm -hmm. coming back to context, that's how important context is, is to really understand what people's vision is, and and it makes it such so much easier to then go to an organization like Conservation International, um, Conservation South Africa, Heading for Health, the Peace Pass Foundation, um, and to, and to, and to sell, sell this concept to them and to say, well, guys, we're making a difference here. I can't mm. tell you exactly what, the, what we're doing, but here's the principles that we're applying. Um, if people can start applying those principles with the tools that's, that's available to them in their rural communities or wherever you are, if you're a commercial farmer, um, you know, it does make a difference to, to understand how the principles fit together. So, the, so those are my clients. But the interesting thing is that that it's been growing. It's the the international recognition and 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 interest is is growing phenomenally. We started with the with this executive course in the beginning of this year because of COVID. We couldn't get our normal heading students yes. from Southern Africa. So I said to Rodi, let's, let's let's just start influencing decision makers. Let's roll out a course where we compress. The whole course into one week, we, we pitch it on a level of decision making for landowners, for conservationists, for NGOs, for community leaders, for government officials, anyone that's in the decision making position um, need to come on this course before we even apply herders to the land. To, yeah. to the land. You, you, need, you, you really need to understand the ecological functioning, okay? to make decisions. And the interesting thing is it's a very value-based uh, course. So we handle the principles we, and we talk about values. And the interesting thing with that is that is, is we all love the land. No one's ever intentionally damaged the land. Okay, no farmer, no, no conservationist, no ecologist. So it's all well intentioned. Um, and we've planned two courses for the year and we're standing on the, on the sixth, I think, for this year. And it's already been filled up for next year. So, so we need to hurry up and get our dates out for next year for the executive courses because it's been filling up. And the people that's really interested in these courses, and that's the interesting thing, is, is, is guys like uh, the Biodiversity Institute of South Africa, the Agricultural Research Center, uh, Moe South Africa, um, Marina Wool South Africa, um, who else is there at the moment? There's, so it's industry leaders. It's, it's industry leaders that's really influenced by the consumer overseas. So their products, the questions are being asked currently in the first world and in, in, in Europe and all over, the, all over the world. The question is being asked, what are farmers doing with this product? If I want to buy this shit or, or I'm investing in meat or whatever, yeah. Yeah. what is the choice? Where does that meat come from? What is the way that it's been treated and handled? And, and it really is now starting to reflect in our courses. These guys are policy makers. And they really need to incorporate these, these natural and these environmental principles into their practice. 
and and there's a lot of interest coming from that side, which is which is phenomenal. amazing, yeah, phenomenal, a, yeah, phenomenal. It's phenomenal. And it's, it's happening amazing. not only here; it's happening all over the world. Yeah. And I think it's 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 fast tracking, you know, um, which is yeah, which is very exciting. Yeah, it is exciting. Johan, yeah. thank you very much. I thank really you. enjoyed the chat. I hope we can do make a difference as well. Uh, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you I'm for sure yours. You will. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, but thank you very much. Yeah, it was really enjoyable talk, and I hope yeah. that we thank influence thank a few people. And outside. it's great, and I and I really want to put out the invitation to 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 everyone is is come and look at what we're doing. This is an open learning site, so we really want to encourage people to call us, contact us, visit us. Uh, let me show. Let me let, let us show you what we're doing. Just and reconnect. Wonderful. Thank you. Go on, thanks.